Hello and welcome to Quest 4. Today we're going to take a look at the Middle Ages, the time period in which the Canterbury Tales is written. Uh, we're going to look at how the society was structured at the time and uh, that'll help you make a little more sense of the tales. The first thing I want to point out, uh, the Canterbury Tales is different than the Cadbury Tales. I always think of these Cadbury eggs every time I think of Canterbury. And now you will too, but no, they are completely different. Canterbury is a city in England. In fact, the chief bishop of England is named the Bishop of Canterbury. Uh, Canterbury is a holy site, a place where people of the Christian faith would uh, take pilgrimages. And we'll talk more about that when we get into the story itself. Before we move on, though, I want you to think of a few things in this video. Number one, what classes exist today? We don't really have formal classes in America. We hear about the upper class and the lower class uh, in, in the news and, and everything, but what classes exist today? So think about that. Uh, number two, think about the church as an organization. What type of uh, power does it have? What type of political power does it have? Uh, can the church do whatever it wants or is it uh, confined by other organizations? And finally, I want you to think about unwritten rules. Uh, so what are some things that you personally are allowed or not allowed to do based not on a written law, but an unwritten law. And I don't just mean your parents' rules, I mean uh, what is considered socially unacceptable in high school culture, in adult culture, in uh, whatever culture you find yourself. All right, let's move on. The Middle Ages officially are from 1066 to 1485. While the dates may vary, these are the official dates that the history books uses. It uses two key events to signify the beginning and end, though there's actually many more reasons. Uh, they begin when William the Conqueror of France in the Battle of Hastings takes over England, brings his French culture, uh, and takes over most of the country. Uh, and it ends in 1485 when Henry Tudor, the grandfather and father of Henry VIII and of Queen Elizabeth uh, kills Richard III and brings about the end of the previous reign. Uh, it is a period of chivalry, of feudalism, and not much else. There's a reason that the Middle Ages are called the Dark Ages sometimes, because there was really no human advancement. We'll talk more about that as we go on. One key player of the Middle Ages is the church. Unlike today, the church is extremely powerful and extremely corrupt. They got this way because they controlled basically all of the information that people received. People couldn't read at the time, and in order to learn something, you had to hear it from the church. The church also had a great power called excommunication. Well, what does this mean? Really, what it means is that you can send somebody to hell. You tell them that they can no longer receive communion from the church, and as a result, they cannot be saved. Uh, you, know, you may disagree with that. However, that is what many people believed back in the day, and so the church had a lot of power over people. In fact, Thomas a Becket, the Bishop of Canterbury in the 1100s, uh, had disagreed with what the king was doing at the time, and so he excommunicated the king. Well, the king didn't like that very much, so he killed Thomas a Becket. This makes him a martyr in the eyes of the church, and that is why people back in the Middle Ages would go on long trips to visit Thomas a Becket's shrine in Canterbury. That's exactly what the pilgrims are doing in the Canterbury Tales. They're taking a long trip to see where Thomas a Becket's grave is, and they want to pay tribute to it. The church also owned land, which gave them a lot of power. Uh, chivalry was uh, the law of the land at the time. Unlike the Anglo-Saxons, which valued violence and glory and personal gain, uh, chivalry w was about virtue and love and serving women and serving one's country. When you think of the traditional knights in shining armor, uh, they were following these elaborate rules and codes, much more refined than the Anglo-Saxons that came before them. Now, many people believe today that these laws were probably made up. There probably were not many people that were following these to the letter. Uh, they were very complex uh, and probably just uh, had to do with stories. But even so, uh, chivalry uh, had a strong hold on the culture of the time. Uh, feudalism. Feudalism is the culture uh, that we find ourselves in. It's the way the economy worked. You remember the Anglo-Saxons were really small villages. You worked for yourself and you also worked for the king. Well, in feudalism, you were in one of three groups. You were either a noble at the top, you were at the church and also near the top, or you were a serf. You were a peasant and you were towards the bottom. If you were at the top, if you were a noble, you were either a baron, a lord, a knight, or perhaps even the king. Uh, but there was really no way to get to that state unless you were born that way. 
uh, the church in the same way. Uh, many people uh, were born into that. And then the serfs, uh, you were born a serf and you died a serf. You really couldn't move upward or downward. Let's talk about those three categories a little more closely. Uh, nobles, very, very rich and very, very few of them compared to all of the peasants and serfs out there. They lived in castles. Whenever you see ancient castles and hear about knights and armor and castles, well, that is because the nobles lived in castles. The nobles would train their own uh, to become knights. Knights were not just grunt soldiers. Knights were very rich. I mean, you had to be to afford all the armor and the horses and the helpers, uh, and they, they had a high standing. Uh, if you were a noble, you would have a coat of arms, something you would hang above your castle door uh, with a symbol on it to signify you and your whole family. Uh, as I said before, you were born into this class, and in addition uh, to just being rich, uh, towards the end of the Middle Ages, the nobles actually took some power from the king. They had enough of uh, King John telling them what to do, uh, and so they took some power from the king, and the nobles at the time were actually sort of the beginnings of a, a democracy uh, that we see later in, in England and then in America. Um, the church, as we mentioned before, very rich, very powerful. Now, not everyone was corrupt in the church. There were certainly plenty of monks that devoted their lives to God and service and poverty and lived in the monasteries and didn't bother anyone. But other people, of course, were corrupt. There's corrupt people everywhere. The church owned a quarter of the land in England. The king owned another quarter, and the final 50% was divided up amongst the barons and the lords. Uh, the church was so powerful it was actually able to control the king at the time. Not all the time, you saw it happen at Thomas of Becket, but from time to time they could get what they wanted. And then finally the serfs, uh, the village people. Uh, they, well, not the village people. Uh, the serfs were slaves. Not literally, they weren't beaten and whipped, but there was really nothing for them to do. They worked on land uh, that was given to them by the barons and lords. They made just enough money to maintain their rent and buy some food, but otherwise they had to pay it all back in rent to the barons and lords. You could not move up from being a serf, at least not towards the end of the 1400s, uh, when the Middle Ages ended. It was a poor, dirty, hungry, and sad life. And so those are the Middle Ages. That's where we find ourselves for the Canterbury Tales. We have people from all three classes in the Canterbury Tales, uh, and I just wanted you to see uh, what people were living like when they were telling these stories. All right, well, go ahead and move on to the next video. Thanks for stopping by, and good luck in Quest 4.